This week marked three years of the Fridays for Future climate protests. 185 countries, tens of thousands of events, and one teenager at the centre of it all, Greta Thunberg. And 157 weeks on from Greta's original school strike outside of the Swedish parliament, the battle to hold world leaders accountable for their lack of action on climate change is as urgent as ever. The urgency laid bare by a report this month from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. It found the Earth will hit its 1.5 degrees Celsius climate limit within 20 years, adding that human activity is changing the climate in unprecedented and, yes, irreversible ways. Earlier, I spoke with the young climate activist who's become an icon for many, Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg, thanks so much for coming back on the show. It's almost exactly three years since you launched your school strike, what was then a solitary protest against climate change by a 15-year-old outside the Swedish parliament in Stockholm, which then morphed into global school strikes involving millions of kids around the world. Did you ever imagine what you started three years ago this month would turn into what it's turned into and what it's turned you into, a global icon? Well, no, of course not. This is something that no one could have predicted. I, at the time, I just felt like I need to do something. Someone needs to do something. And I'm someone, so I can do something. Uh, and then the idea was to sit there every day until the Swedish election. And then I did that. But after the election, I thought, what should I stop now when, when, when I have got this going and when more people are joining? So then I and some other activists decided that we were going to continue for every Friday. Um, until Sweden was in line with the Paris Agreement, we said. And then we just went on with it every Friday. And by time, more and more people started to join. And then suddenly it became mm -hmm. a global movement. A global movement started uh, by a single girl in Stockholm. In very impressive, uh, as I've said before. Earlier this month, Greta, the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, put out a pretty devastating report, which the UN Secretary General called a code red for humanity. In a New York Times op-ed last week that you co-authored with other youth climate activists from across the world, you wrote that young people like us have been sounding this alarm for years. You just haven't listened. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Um, of course, we can have many theories about it, but it feels like we it's it's something that we don't want to listen to that many people, people in power don't want to because it's very uncomfortable. It is something that they do not want to deal with. So they just continue to push it down in the future, down the road for, for the children to handle, to deal with. And that's that's very shameful. And it's. Um, yeah. But as long as we don't treat the crisis like a crisis, we can continue on like today and they will get away with not caring about this, unfortunately. And it, unfortunately, and it is shameful, it's the right word that you use. What was your own reaction to this recent IPCC report? Was it a real blow to you to see just how bad things are, even after three years of activism from you and millions of others? I saw you point out on Twitter that since the first school strike, the world has emitted over 120 billion tons of CO2. Uh, to be honest, I mean, this report uh, summarizes, like, these last years of, of research, so it's not something that's revolutionary and new. Uh, we could have predicted what was said in this report, so to speak. Um, but what's, what I find very hard hopeful is that there are more and more scientists now who are starting to tell it like it is. Um, it feels like many are becoming more comfortable with actually telling the truth and not watering it down so much. Of course, this is very moderate, um, but, but still. So I find that very hopeful, at least. What would be what could be a risk now is that people would be scared and say, like, people won't be able to handle the truth. So we tell them a lie and give them false hope so that we fall back to sleep. And um, that could be a risk in that. So I hope that this can be a wake up call for us because, I mean, we already knew that the situation was very, very dire and that we need to act now. And this confirms that. I mean, if it's one core point of this article, of this report, it is that we are running out of time, but we still have a chance to turn this around. We can still avoid the worst consequences.
It, there is a danger, isn't there, between scaring people justifiably with what's coming and what has already come and demoralizing them into then not acting. Mm. Yes, of course, there's a very fine balance between being enough hopeful so that people won't give up, but also not making it sound like we don't need to do anything because things are being taken care of. Yes. Um, yeah. Last time you came on the show, Greta, back in March, you said in a clip that later went viral online, uh, you said this about the Joe Biden administration and whether it was tackling climate change seriously. Have I would just like him to, I mean, to basically just treat the climate crisis like a crisis. Uh, they have said themselves that this is an existential threat and uh, they better treat it accordingly, uh, which they are not. I mean, they are just treating climate, the climate crisis like as it was a political topic um, among other topics and, um, yeah, treat it as a crisis. Has your view of the Biden administration and its stance on climate change, has that changed in the intervening months, especially in the wake of the big infrastructure and budget reconciliation bills currently in Congress, both of which have some pretty serious measures in them to tackle climate change? Yeah, unfortunately, um, no, my view has not changed. This has just confirmed uh, this administration is not ready to, <laughs> to, um, to act as seriously as we need, um, unfortunately. But that was what I expected. One of the things we discussed extensively on this show when the new IPCC report came out earlier this month, warning that the window for action is closing, some areas it's already closed, is where does the blame lie? Is it with individuals who have refused to change their lifestyles, fly less, drive less? Is it with fossil fuel companies? Is it with politicians who haven't acted? Where do you think the blame lies? I mean, the blame lies with, of course, with the people who are in charge, but also the system itself. Um, of course, this is not up to individuals to change. Of course, we cannot blame individuals who, who don't want to stop flying and so on. That's just ridiculous. Um, of course, we will need individuals pushing for change, but that's not, that's not the core of this crisis. Um, there are some, some players who have enormous responsibility and who need to be held accountable. We talk about these 100 companies who are responsible for a huge part of the climate climate crisis for contributing to it. But then we also need to remember that um, if these 100 companies disappeared, the climate crisis wouldn't disappear because it's a much larger structural issue. So that's where the blame lies, I think.